thank you everyone for joining our virtual brown bag seminar. We're gonna have a series of these over the next few weeks and months, so we'll make sure you hear about those. Um, today we're, we're excited to talk about wireworm and we have um, entomologists Ben Deal and Bev Gordeman. Um, so Ben is uh, an ag research tech in Bev's program and um, both, both Bev and Ben have done work at Ohio State um, and Ben did his master's work at um, Texas A&M and Bev is a, an assistant research professor at um, our center in entomology. So they're going to talk to us today about wireworm. Um, if you have any questions during the seminar, please put them in the chat box and we'll address them at the end of the seminar. If we can't get to all the questions, Bev and Ben will um, address them later and we will post this video on our website along with answers to questions. So we'll make sure people that weren't able to, to join for the seminar can get the information. So with that, um, I'll have Ben go ahead. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Deal. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this brown bag seminar. Uh, again, today we're gonna be talking about wireworms, the ultimate foe. Um, so we had um, been having a lot more issues with wireworms here at the station recently. Uh, we've had some a lot of uh, damage to some trials and things. So a lot of people asked us to kind of talk about wireworms, about the situation. And so I'm gonna talk about what a wireworm is, um, what kind of wireworms we have around here, and then a little bit about the damage that they cause. And then Bev is gonna cover um, sampling, monitoring of wireworms, and then also some management strategies. So with that, we'll get started. So what is a wireworm? That's gonna be the first question. Uh, if we're gonna be fighting this foe, you know that you need to figure out everything about your enemy first. So I've underlined the worm here in wireworm because this is a common term that a lot of people use for certain pests. So you hear people say that they have worms in their apples or they have worms on their cabbage plants or all kinds of things, but this can mean different things to different people. So when we talk about a worm here, what is a wireworm? Uh, first off, it's not a, an earthworm, so it's not like a true worm that you would uh, encounter in your soil. Uh, it's also not a caterpillar, so the larvae of butterflies and moths, again called caterpillars. So some people call these worms. You have worms uh, in your apples. These can be a certain type of moth. You have uh, worms on your um, cabbage, on your spinach they're eating at the be butterfly caterpillars. This caterpillar here is um, so these can actually be doing uh, similar damage to wireworms and be in the same area, but a wireworm is not a caterpillar, even though we're getting closer because it's an insect. So then we have fly maggots. So uh, some people talk about these as being worms. So you have worms again in your apples and your cherries. Um, there's some that will skeletonize leaves. There's leaf miner maggots, um, but these are also not uh, wireworms are also not maggots. So here's a picture of a wireworm. This is our enemy here, our foe. So what exactly is it then if it's not any of those? So they're actually click beetle larvae. So they're a beetle larva. Um, if you think about other beetles, you know, you have ground beetles that are out in your area, beneficial predators, you have uh, ladybird beetles, weevils, things like that. So those are all beetles as well. But what specifically is a click beetle? So they're in the family Elateridae. Uh, this is a beetle family. The common name, again, is click beetles. So uh, why are these guys called click beetles? And this is due to the ability of most of the species in this group to be able to kind of click um, their body and they can pop themselves into the air if they're stuck on their back or maybe to avoid a predator. So uh, if you look on the right here, uh, this is kind of what the click beetle would look like if it's about to click. Usually they're flipped over on their back, their, tuck, their legs are all tucked up, and you can see that they use this spine uh, and groove mechanism on the underside of their thorax. So you can see this big spine. Uh, pic the picture on the left shows a, a, a side view of it, and they can fit this spine into the groove, and they can exert pressure on it, and basically it pops when it kind of pops out of the groove, and it can send them flying into the air. So depending on the size of the, of the click beetle, it can be a couple inches or up to a foot. Uh, there's some pretty big click beetles. 
So they can use this to kind of right themselves or maybe to escape a predator if something's trying to eat them. So um, first off, how to identify beetles. So if you find some insects uh, out in your field and you're thinking that maybe that they could be click beetles, first you have to know if it's a beetle. So some of the better uh, beetle characters, the main one here uh, to tell beetles apart from other insects, other pests, uh, the four wings are hardened into protective elytra. So um, these are the wing covers. So if you look at this picture on the left, this is a click beetle. You can see that the four wings have been modified into these kind of shells that fit over the hind wings, the more membranous, delicate wings. Um, so in most insects, most flying insects, the kind of core plan is to have two pairs of wings, four wings and hind wings. So in the beetles, the four wings have just been modified into these protective shells. Um, the real character, you can obviously tell that they have these wing cases, but the easier character is to look for this line. So if you look at the right picture, you see this line running down the back of the beetle, down the abdomen, and this is where those two uh, wing cases meet. So this is a really good character to tell that you're looking at a beetle. Um, beetles come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, so it's not always quite as evident. Some of them have these wing cases reduced, um, but for the most part, if you see this line, it looks like it's got a hard shell on it. That's a pretty good indication you're looking at a beetle. Uh, secondly, um, beetles have chewing mouth parts. So this is on the left is a picture of an adult click beetle. Uh, you can see the mandibles there, the chewing mandibles. And on the right, this is a, a close-up view of a wireworm head, the immature stage. So you can see they have the chewing mouth parts and this is how they're gonna be doing all the damage to your crops. Now you've decided that you have a beetle so how are you going to further identify it and confirm that it might be a click beetle? So click beetles specifically, um, most of the pest species are going to be between 8 and 20 millimeters long. They have kind of elongated bodies. You can see that the tip of the, air, the abdomen usually narrows at the end. And the pronotum, which is the, basically the top of the thorax, you can see in this picture on the right, it is rounded, usually a little bit rounded. Uh, when you view them from the side, you can see that they have this kind of major joint uh, right where this clicking action happens. So you have sort of uh, the abdomen with the wing covers and then you have the pronotum and the head as, as another piece and it kind of flexes. So you can see that there's this major joint uh, when viewed from the side. Um, the head is usually hidden from above. As you, again, you can see in the right hand picture, you can see a little bit of it. Um, but uh, again, on the left hand picture, you can see how it's mostly concealed, the head. Antennae are usually long and thin. There are a few that have some different ones, like the picture on the left has these kind of flattened serrated antennae, but usually they're kind of long and thin in the adults. And another good click beetle character are uh, these spines. So also on the pronotum, that rounded structure on the thorax, you see these two spines that come off of the hind corners, uh, one on each side. That's usually a good indication that you're looking at a click beetle. So we've covered the adults. So now we can move on to the wireworms, which are the uh, immature stages of the click beetle. So how to tell these guys apart from other things you might find out in the field in the soil. So obviously they're, they have a long tube-like body. Um, there's some other wireworm larvae that look a little bit different, a little bit more flattened, um, uh, not quite as round, but most of the, most of the pest ones are gonna look similar to this. They have a really hard, uh, shiny exoskeleton you can see in the picture here. So this is one of the reasons why they could be a little tougher than some other pests. Um, if you're talking about maggots or caterpillars, things like that, they have kind of a softer body. Um, but these wireworms, they have a really hard protective like shell-like body, so they're a little, a little better at, at uh, um, not being damaged by mechanical issues. And then also this helps them to not dry out as quickly. Um, a lot of these ones are going to be this kind of toasted caramel color. Uh, that might be kind of gross. I couldn't think of a better description, but uh, that's what it kind of looks like to me. So that's what I went with it. And often you see towards the head. So on the right side of this picture, there's usually a little bit of a darker color. So that's one way that you can tell kind of the head from the, from the tip of the abdomen. Uh, they do have six legs, even though they're immatures. Um, so you can see behind the head, they have these, uh, three pairs of legs. And this can help you kind of differentiate them between like a maggot, which doesn't have legs. Um, caterpillars have legs like this, but they also have 
um, different um, leg-like structures along the body as well. But the uh, wireworm only have these uh, six legs up near the head. And then of course, because they're beetles, they have the chewing mouth parts. So I've highlighted that these top four characters are probably the best to use out in the field, um, just because you can kind of see it with the naked eye if you have them in your palm. Uh, you could use a little uh, magnifying glass if you wanted, but it's pretty, pretty easy to tell that you're looking at a wireworm once you know what you're looking for. So let's talk a little bit about the biology, uh, life cycle. So wireworms, they undergo complete metamorphosis. So this is similar to, well, the same as uh, like butterflies and moths or flies. So essentially they have the four stages. They have an egg, they have the larva, which here is the wireworm. And then they have the pupil stage, kind of the resting stage where they're totally reorganizing their body to become an adult. And then they have the adult stage. So uh, for the, in the Pacific Northwest here, generally they overwinter as adults or uh, larvae in the soil. The adults tend to mate in late spring or early June. And when the females, after mating, um, they'll lay up to 350 eggs, that's on the high side, but they could do that a couple times uh, and the eggs are usually laid one to six inches deep in the soil. Uh, eggs, depending on weather conditions, will hatch in maybe about a, a month or so. Now, this is the, the really important part here. Uh, some larvae can take between two to five years to develop fully into an adult. So obviously this has major management implications because uh, these, you're gonna have several years of wireworms in a field um, at the same time. So different developmental uh, stages. So you're gonna have small larvae, you're gonna have big larvae. And again, these can take five years to develop. So it's not like something that's done in, in one season and then it's gone and, and you have to, it has to come back the next year. These, these guys are going to be in the soil um, for a long time. And then obviously you have the overlapping sizes of the larvae, like I said. So since two to five years, you can have small ones, uh, medium sized big ones at all times throughout the year. So unlike other pests where you might have immatures earlier in the year um, and then larger ones at the end, here you can start off the year with, with pretty big uh, wireworms. So that can affect the damage that they cause. Now they pupate um, in the soil. Oh, oh, so they, uh, they, they do move vertically in the soil. So they move up and down. Uh, a lot of this has to do with temperature or maybe looking for food. They don't move as much uh, horizontally. So there's not, they don't move throughout different parts of the, of the fields. Usually they stay pretty close, but they do move up and down. Uh, they pupate in the soil from beginning in spring to summer. And to identify the pupae, one good thing is that they have a specific type of pupa called an exorate pupa. So you can see this picture on the right here. This is a pupa of a click beetle. And what this means is the appendages, so you can see the antennae, the legs, the wings, they're all free. So they could, they could technically move around. Um, they're not fused to the side of the pupa like it would be in a butterfly or moth. So that's one indication that you're looking at maybe a beetle pupa. There could be other beetles, but um, it could help hint that that might be a, a click beetle pupa that you found. And then after about three weeks, the adults will emerge. So you can see there's a chart down here. Uh, this kind of gives you a general uh, view of the different stages in the Pacific Northwest and when they're active. So again, we have the adults uh, most of the year, eggs only for uh, two months or so, Larvae, again, all year long, and you're going to have a lot of different stages um, all together. And then the PP, again, just for uh, about two months or so. So what kind of risk from wireworms? So they have a very large host range. They'll feed on a lot of different things. And the really difficult thing about wireworms is they will also feed in several different ways, uh, a lot of different, uh, different ways of damage. So we can see here, uh, there's a potato. You can see one of the characteristic damage um, visuals for wireworms are these uh, oval holes where basically they're just sticking their head um, into, the, into the crop and they're just feeding on it. They're not really burrowing that far in, it's just kind of their head. And then for some reason they're backing out to feed elsewhere or they don't, they don't really do much more than just feed around where their head is. So you can see this on the potatoes on the left, uh, a couple holes. 
and then there's this kind of cut through where you can see how far how they just kind of went a little bit into the potato and then stopped you can see that on the right on the radish and then also on the garlic bulb as well these kind of oval holes so that's a really good indicator that you're looking at wireworm damage uh, another way that they will affect crops they will fully consume seeds or just feed on them enough to make them not viable so if you're planting seeds you can have wireworms that completely destroy a seed um, and then you get nothing out of it and then finally they'll also bore into certain parts of plants so they'll bore into the root and then also into the kind of the lower stem area so these are different ways that they affect crops you can see there's different uh, signs to look for and again they do feed on a lot of a lot of different um, plants so what that might look like in the field so example some stand damage uh, you see a weak stand where you have some dead, dying plants um, where these wireworms have been feeding. You'll notice it's kind of localized just to one or two plants there. Or if you're planting seeds, you might have an entire plant missing from the row, and that's just where that they've either eaten the entire seed or they've destroyed the seed by feeding so that nothing grew out of that. And on specific, on individual plants, um, You'll see a lot of dead central leaves, and this is from kind of the boring into the root or stem again. Uh, the plant is all often wilted, discolored, and usually it's still attached to the roots. Um, there are some other pests like cutworms, which will kind of cut through the whole um, plant stem root area, but usually with wireworms, they're still attached. So now we will look at uh, some examples from the station here. So these are some uh, lettuce that we had and um, Bev noticed some damage on it. So she brought in some samples. So it's kind of hard to see in this first image, but if we zoom in a little bit, you can see there's the back end of a wireworm sticking out of the bottom of the stem kind of root junction area. And I pulled that guy out with some forceps and you can see the hole that he was in. So pretty much most of his body was all the way up in there uh, chewing away. So you could tell that um, there was something wrong with the plant. It wasn't quite this wilted, that's just from being out of the ground, but you could tell that there was, uh, the plant wasn't doing well, and then this was the reason. So another example of lettuce. So this one actually did become detached from the root. Um, again, if we look down here at the base, you can see somebody kind of hiding there. I uh, cut that open, and I actually found two in there. So there were two wireworms inside there, uh, happily chewing away. Um, obviously not good for the plant. And that's a picture of the root where it kind of came off so you can see that it was totally hollow. Some examples from radish here at the station. So again, these oval holes that we talked about this is a really good indication that you've got wireworms feeding on, on your radishes. Um, another example of damage that they do are these tracks that kind of run across the surface. So on the left here is a, is a radish that we have. Um, you can see that it may have been a, a, a smaller wireworm that's just kind of laying there, uh, kind of feeding on the surface. They didn't really bore into it. It's just eating along the, along the skin there. And then on the right, you can see some nice illustrations of some other crops with this kind of surface feeding uh, on carrots and potatoes. Uh, you could also see those oval holes on there as well. So these are some more radishes. Uh, this is when things kind of start to get a little tricky because there's kind of multiple things that could be going on here. Um, so it looks like on this left one, at least, there's probably some uh, wireworm damage, but uh, some of the wireworm damage can be similar to other pest damage. So here we collected these to get root maggots out of them, and there were definitely root maggots in there. So we know that they were there, but it's kind of difficult to tell which damage is from uh, which pest at times, because there are some uh, flies that will move in after there's already damage. So maybe the wireworm started feeding and then the flies sensed the damage and then they came in and laid their eggs. So then you get kind of a secondary pest in there. So it's sort of hard to tell who started it or, or who did exactly what, um, but it definitely looks like there's a couple of different things going on here. Um, but for root maggots, so just a quick example. So here are some examples of the root maggots that we did find. You can see on the, the top left, there's some of this kind of uh, tunneling on the surface of the radish. So again, that could look kind of similar to what a wireworm would do. Uh, the bottom left, this is a maggot that's totally burrowed into the, the center of the radish. 
And on the right, this is a big happy maggot who's got himself a little home there, just happily feasting away. Um, but you can see that there's some difference between what the uh, maggots do versus the wireworms. So with the maggots, they're kind of chewing everything up, making a big mess. There's uh, this accompanying rock, a little mess here. You can usually, once you get a hang of it, you can tell what might have been wireworm versus uh, root maggots. But you can tell if it's similar damage, it, it can be a little tricky to tell what's actually causing the damage at times. So one more example here from radishes. Um, again, you can see there might be a couple different things going on here just because of the size of the damage. Um, but this looks like it might be a little bit too big for a wireworm, so it looks like chewing. Um, but you have to think about the size uh, and the shape of the damage. So what could this be? Uh, most likely this was a cutworm or some um, uh, caterpillar pest because these guys will actually go down into the soil and, and feed on, on these radishes and beets and things like that as well. So this one was probably too big to be a wireworm, so it looks like it was most likely some sort of uh, lepidopteran pest. So let's talk a little bit about what types of wireworms are around here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so more in general, there's about a thousand species of click beetles described from North America. Um, in Western Washington, I found over a hundred species, and this was from uh, a book by Hatch, 1991, The Beetles of the Pacific Northwest. So luckily, most of these are gonna have no uh, effect on crops or the agricultural environment at all. Uh, they're just kind of out in nature. Some of them are predatory. They actually feed in, in rotting logs or under bark. They'll eat other arthropods and things like that. Other ones are just, you know, eating natural, naturally occurring plants. Um, but there's really fewer than 10 that are considered to be a serious economic pest here in Washington State. There's likely to be others that you would find um, kind of on the edges around the field where you have weeds or native plants, or they just might get into your field, um, but aren't serious pests. But you can see here, uh, these are kind of the main um, seven that have been talked about in the Pacific Northwest. And two of them, the Agrioides uh, lineatus and Obscurus, these are the two main pest species that are really of economic concern here. So a little bit of a backstory with these two species. So these are introduced from Europe, like a lot of our uh, pests here, uh, they're exotic. So these were known to be in British Columbia since about the 1950s. First detected in Washington state in 1997. And there's been a lot of um, surveys along kind of the I-5 corridor here, um, along Western Washington to see just how far these species are spreading. Um, they've been detected out on the San Juans, um, a lot of them down in King County. You can see here on the map, Whatcom County, we have them in Skagit, uh, Snohomish, all the way down into Oregon, they've detected them. So they're definitely spreading. Uh, these are probably the two um, most economically important species here in Western Washington, and they seem to be becoming more of a threat. And one estimate for the Fraser Valley in BC uh, they're estimated to cause about five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars in losses in crops just in 1994 alone. So it's probably become a bigger issue since then. So these are two of the major pest species that you are likely to run into. And a little bit about um, these two species here at the station. So this year um, our lab has been doing some trapping to get some idea uh, to look for these two species. And this is based on pheromone traps. So basically they have two, two pheromones and these are for the adult beetles. And they attract, uh, they have a species, a pheromone for lineatus and a pheromone for obscurus. So we keep the two traps separately. Um, one should attract one species, one should attract the other. There is a little bit of overlap. Uh, one of these go to the uh, other species pheromone trap, but the other one uh, just only goes to its own. So there's a little bit of overlap that you have to watch out for. But some numbers here, so between April 22nd and June 8th, uh, we found about 1,700 specimens in the uh, lineatus traps and only about 12 specimens in the obscurus traps. So uh, just because they're in there um, doesn't totally mean that that's what they are. Uh, we're gonna wait for some identifications to be confirmed. Um, but it seems like we may have um, 
those two species here at the station. Seems definitely like Lineatus. Um, we've seen that one for sure. It's kind of got these stripes running down the, the elytra, so that one's pretty easy to determine. Uh, we'll have to double check on the Obscurus. And it also appears that Lineatus is the more locally common species here. And then all this with the caveat that kind of understanding all of this uh, um, species, what species, uh, when they're active, all the biology and everything is still definitely a work in progress. Um, some of the data for the life cycle and seasonality and everything comes from different parts of Washington um, where they've been a crop uh, pest for much longer. And so how that data applies to Western Washington um, is still to be understood, but there's a lot of groups working on it. Um, so hopefully we can get a better understanding of that in the near future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bev and she's gonna talk again about monitoring and sampling uh, for wireworms and then also some management strategies. Okay, uh, so uh, in my section, I'm gonna talk about uh, monitoring or sampling and management. Um, here's why wireworms are really an ultimate pest. Ben talked a little bit about the uh, sclerotization or the, the cuticle. Uh, and so they're very, very tough. They're highly sclerotized and that makes them really harder to kill. Plus, uh, these insects are really highly mobile. Uh, they have an unpredictable behavior and so it's almost impossible to quantify them. Uh, and they are long lived. Uh, because you have this accumulation or, or overlapping generations from, from multiple years, you have this resident population that is existing uh, in the soil. And of course, you'll have some addition and some subtraction of this population every year. But uh, basically, they're, they're hanging around as long as there's food. Here's some factors that promote wireworm. Um, if you plan to plant and you recently clear land, uh, especially from something like sod, pasture, or even a grass cover crop, uh, then you might expect to have some problems with wireworm. If the, if the area has been in grass for over 10 years, then maybe uh, a lot of pressure from wireworm. Uh, we know that wireworm also uh, prefers uh, a damp, uh, soil or so high moisture would be areas or low areas would be where you might watch for some uh, problems with wireworm. Uh, in hot dry weather uh, they're going to search out for moisture and they can find this oftentimes in tuber or root crops like your potatoes uh, and if you delay harvesting those potatoes they're sitting out there and they're just ready to be hit the so the longer you wait, the more potential be for damage. There are some soil preferences. Uh, so they like silty or, or medium textured, well-drained soil. Uh, they don't want to be uh, sitting in water, of course. You know, they, they, they don't have gills. And so particularly here in Western Washington, where we have a shallow water table, we've kind of gotten trapped in, in, a, in a small area here, uh, a depth of soil. So uh, they also prefer recently broken sod or heavily tilled sod. And they, they like high organic matter because that organic matter is decomposing. And when it decomposes, it, it produces carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is what attracts wireworms. So you're trying to figure out how to control wireworms. There's actually about four different ways. You can try to outgrow them. Uh, you can use uh, methods to deter them, or you can try to kill them, or you can try to attract them away. So for direct seeded crops, these are the ones that potentially have some possibility about growing. Uh, if you can plant corn and get three weeks on corn, uh, then uh, they say it's good to go. Uh, but uh, certainly it's that vulnerable time during germination uh, that's when it's producing some CO2 and it's attracting those wireworms to it. And as Ben showed you, they can uh, potentially take out multiple seeds, a single wireworm can. So the idea is to uh, speed up that germination time. And so um, how can we do that? We can seed into warmer, moist soil. 
uh, we can put a, a light topping of rotting manure or phosphate fertilizer on it. The idea there is to encourage your root development and maybe early maturity. Uh, and so it just so happens, if you look at both those things, good grief, that's what uh, wireworms like too. So, you know, there's a conundrum here. We want to speed up germination. We just want to get past that vulnerable time, but we don't want to try to attract them either. Uh, and also in Western Washington, if we use a pre-plant incorporate insecticide, let's say like capture Lafar, uh, for instance, or any other type of insecticide at plant, like in furrow over the seed or some other type of application at plant, then it sort of uh, puts the seed in with a little bit of protection. You might even consider seed treatments. Uh, seed treatments are, are available for some crops, but not others. The second method was to, to, to try to deter them. And so we're talking about cultural control methods, really. So if you look at this first uh, section, let me see if I can use my, I don't know if this is visible, but right in here, uh, it doesn't matter where they are in their life cycle because it's protective of their biology. So you're packing and firming the soil. You're trying to firm it up there in the rows, trying to make it a little harder for them to move through that soil. Uh, crop rotation. Uh, you want to think about crop rotation because certain crops can actually attract them. We'll talk about crop rotation in just a few minutes. Uh, there's also resistant varieties uh, that we can talk about. So these methods, uh, along with field flooding, potentially field flooding could, um, could actually drown them uh, because at that time, uh, the adults at least are pupating in the soil. Uh, the larvae are down in there too, but they're a little more mobile. Uh, and then uh, certainly things that you can plant uh, may have more resistance uh, than other things. So these are things that you would think about and not necessarily have to have their biology in mind. But down below here, gosh, and I can't even see for these. Okay. Uh, down below here, you can see that uh, mechanical injury and starvation are methods that really rely on you knowing the biology. So really, because there's so, uh, so many different species uh, of wireworms, uh, it's important to know which species you have and their biology in order to control them better. So when it comes to mechanical injury and starvation, uh, if you cultivate the soil uh, down three to 15 inches in the latter half of July to August, you're, you might be able to destroy some of those pupae. Those, those uh, pupae are actually in little soil cells. So if you break those cells, you're going to kill the pupae. And the larvae are down there too. And you might be able to bring some up to the surface so that uh, birds can eat them. Uh, and also another uh, method could be to destroy all that green growth. If you have an opportunity to destroy the green growth in the field, in that period of time, June and July, it's possible that you can starve those little tiny neonate larvae that have hatched from eggs that were recently laid. Oops. Crop rotation is something that we're looking uh, here at the station uh, really closely. And uh, for crop rotation, we're thinking of things like mustard, uh, buckwheat, uh, and even alfalfa. So it's not just any old mustard. It's uh, varieties that have been selected for uh, fumigation properties. And uh, these, these uh, plants have to be mowed and incorporated immediately when the wireworms are active in those upper layers of the soil. Uh, buckwheat, on the other hand, is considered a non-host. Uh, so if you were to plant two years of buckwheat, uh, then your uh, then your likely to have reduced potato damage from wireworm. And for alfalfa, you can, if you manage alfalfa, manage those weeds, or use a Roundup Ready alfalfa, uh, then this is a crop that also uh, suppresses the populations. When it comes to chemical control, um, sort of. Sort of we're, we're killing them, but certainly we can have effects from chemicals. And um, you need to know straight away that different species have different susceptibility to insecticides. Some are more susceptible than others. 
And so you just can't look at a, a type of insecticide and say, oh, this will be uh, effective against all of them. So there are some differences. Um, for instance, neonicotinoid, uh, excuse me, neonicotinoid seed treatments. All right, this is a little bit of insecticide that's coating a seed. If the insect were to feed on that seed coating or uh, if it moves a little bit into the soil surrounding the seed, then it can affect or it can um, be, act like a little bit of a narcotic, uh, but it does not really reduce that resident population of, of wireworms. So in this case, uh, many of the chemicals that we'll talk about uh, actually just repel them or maybe make them drunk. As long as we can just keep them from, uh, from affecting our crops, that's the whole point. So if we can get them to be repelled, that might be good enough. So we don't have to actually think we have to kill the whole population to be effective. We just wanna protect our crops and, and get something to market. So if you look down a little farther here to neonicotinoid contact exposure, this is what I was talking about. It causes a prolonged morbidity. You can see there, greater than 150 days, but then look what happens after that. You'll have full recovery. So it sort of, uh, you know, makes them woozy or a little bit drunk. But again, if that's long enough to get your crop out, that's good enough. Uh, on the other hand, pyrethroids like bifenthrin, they have a lot of repellency, even after a year. Bifenthrin uh, and some of your other pyrethroids tend to bind to the soil. And so their degradation curve or their decline in the soil is, is uh, sort of slow. And so we can benefit from that. And we have seen on the station here where uh, bifenthrin has been uh, pretty good uh, for our crops. Um, also, there's uh, one point here. If you were to use uh, a, a pheromone trap, trapping for Agriotes lineatus, let's say, and you know when that peak is going to occur, then if you follow that peak flight with uh, two uh, applications of pyrethroid spray, uh, then uh, that would be uh, one way to reduce that overposition. And um, the next one is chlorpyrifos and diazinam, and these uh, IRAC group A, uh, they reported to have adequate control and are, are quite popular in Western Washington for different crops. Uh, and uh, the last one I wanna mention here is uh, fipronil. And so fipronil is a material that's only registered for corn and potatoes. And this one actually can cause a mortality uh, and, and give you a little bit extended protection for months, but we'll talk about fipronil in just a few minutes. So in the state of Washington, here are the different groups, the different modes of action that have wireworm on the label. So you can find over 200 products registered in Washington that you could use on wireworm. Uh, but there's actually only eight modes of action. So you've got a lot of products of the same thing. You've got plenty of different ones like um, bifenthrin. Bifenthrin comes in gate, it comes in capture. So you can see that uh, although you have 200 products, there's just these groups right here uh, that are going to um, have some efficacy. So look at the red ones right here. We have the carbamates and organophosphates. Here's your diazinon, here's your ethoprop, um, and here's uh, chlorpyrifos. Uh, then you look to uh, IRAC number two, and this is where your fipronil is. And then if you look at your pyrethroids, which are IRAC three, so we're talking about rotation potential here. We're talking about um, their mode of action. Pyrethroids are in um, your IRAC number three, and you can see that these different um, active ingredients here, alpha cyhalothrin, beta cyfluthrin, bifenthrin, cyfluthrin, lambda cyhalothrin, tefluthrin, uh, and zeta cypermethrin. Uh, these are all pyrethroids. They, uh, some of them have registrations for, uh, for wireworm, and some of them are registered on your crops, but not all of these are registered on all crops. So don't think that, oh, I'm gonna switch from here and then go to here. Of course, you're gonna to have to read that label and find out whether your crop is on the label and then um, you know, whether it'd be suitable for you and for your, um, your market. Here's your neonicotinoids over here. And this is in IRAC class 4A. 
And uh, there is uh, clothianidin, imidacloprid, thiamethoxam. These are a few of the ones that are registered for um, or have registrations for wireworms. Uh, down here you have uh, IRAC-6. Uh, this will be your abamectin, your avermectin, uh, those types of milbamectin, those types of uh, materials. Even your fumigants have wireworm on the label. Of course, many of these will be uh, eliminated in the future, uh, but you can see that right now uh, there are some registrations that have wireworm in them, and it will help with, uh, with populations in the soil as long as they're around. Uh, there are some uh, botanicals, and um, you can see um, uh, there's uh, several different ones. We'll be talking about neem or azadiractin uh, this morning. Uh, your diamides are uh, pretty popular. This is IRAC 28, and this includes your chlorantranilaprol and your cyantranilaprol. And uh, this includes all the groups that have uh, the mode of actions with some efficacy towards wireworm. Pretty much the center of uh, the universe uh, for a wireworm, um, wireworm research has been BC. Bob Vernon, uh, Wim Van Herc, uh, they pretty much uh, spent their careers on, um, on wireworms. And so we can learn a lot from them. There are some other researchers, of course, here in uh, Washington State uh, that are also working on wireworms. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, Bob and, and Wim have done some great work. Uh, this is something uh, that Wim has produced, um, this a bit of information here. This re is regards to seed treatments. Uh, primarily it's for seed treatments for wheat, uh, but you can see here what I'm saying. Uh, for the neonicotinoids, um, it is reversible. It's just intoxication, but yet you've got good enough time to get a, a fair stand in wheat. Pyrethroids, you're just repelling them, moving them away. You're not really killing them, uh, but you can also get a good uh, stand there. Uh, your fipronil, uh, it has a low rate, uh, rate of kill, but it will kill all the species and you can still get a good stand of wheat. Everything else uh, um, has not shown very good efficacy. So this is the reality. Primarily uh, for us, we've been using neonicotinoids and pyrethroids and some of your, um, your diazinon, your uh, group uh, one products. So let's talk about monitoring. How can we determine how many wireworms are in the field? Well, the basic thing about monitoring for wireworms, the, the premise that we're using is that we're trying to attract them uh, by producing carbon dioxide. So germinating seed produces carbon dioxide and that's the whole point. They're going towards that seed. So to attract them with an effective monitoring method, we're gonna have to have something that also produces uh, CO2. Uh, and they say that uh, one wireworm in a trap is equal to about 20,000 per acre. Kind of a fun statistic, sort of. Oh gosh, here we go. So let's look at the sampling methods. And uh, it, it turns out that there's some uh, species differences on what they like. So uh, we're looking at Limonius canis right here and our Agriotes uh, species uh, like Lineatus and Obscurus. Uh, so uh, when it comes to canis, they tend to like the flower bait balls uh, better. And so you can uh, increase the chances that you can find them uh, by using a flour bait ball, and the recipe is pretty simple. Again, you're using uh, rolled oats or flour, you're, you're mixing it with honey to stick it all together in a little water. You're gonna form these baseball sized balls, and they're not covered with anything. They, they just seem to stick together. And so with these, you're going to put them uh, down into the soil, oh, six inches or so, and then you're going to leave it uh, for about a week. And, um, uh, it's said that that fungus that is uh, breaking down that flower is what's producing that carbon dioxide. But what happens if you leave these baits too long, it can, it can be the reverse. It can repel the wireworms. So you want to put your, your bait balls out, but don't leave them out too long. I'd say seven days is, is good enough. 
And then for the agriote species, uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, wheat uh, and wheat and corn, uh, potentially that mixture. Uh, we put it in a little nylon bag and we soak this overnight. You can see here uh, in the center, uh, you can see the, where uh, the bag has been put into the soil. Uh, we're, as I said, you soak it overnight to kind of give it a head start to try to begin to germinate. And you're going to bury it five, six inches down and retrieve it after one week. So again, these kernels over here are producing that uh, CO2 to attract the, the wireworm. And over here, the uh, fungus on that flower, breaking it down, producing CO2 that attracts them. So what could be uh, wrong with that? Uh, what's wrong is um, we've had a devil of time getting our bait bags to work. And I may switch to, to flower pretty soon. It's been so cool here, we might still be able to, um, to collect some. So help my bait bags aren't working. Here are some reasons why. So the sampling method could be species dependent. They could prefer one or the other. Uh, wireworms are highly aggregated in the field. So you have patchy areas. You may not have wireworm where you're putting out that bag. And, and wireworms are really mobile. They can move up and down whenever they feel like it. And uh, so if the soil gets too warm, then you're not going to have very good, uh, good efficacy with your, with your bait bags. Uh, if you leave the baits too long, remember that could repel the wireworm. Uh, low soil temperatures or inclement weather, this can reduce the bait efficacy. So you really want to uh, focus when the soil temperatures are about 50 to 60 degrees, that's when you're going to have the best, uh, best effect from your bait bags. And um, one problem is if you've recently tilled that soil, you've got competing sources of carbon dioxide in the soil. So they may be uh, going towards other things. And so you may not find efficacy for any of those reasons there. Uh, if you want to uh, increase the activity in the spring, you can put a one foot square black plastic uh, and kind of pin it down over that bait site. Uh, this is solarizing and it warms up that soil and it also increases the germination. So how good are these baits uh, and how good is monitoring? It's difficult to say. Uh, very few growers go to the effort of putting out all these bait bags and things. Uh, so basically the, the monitoring methods are way to tell you, yep, they're here, but it may not give you a very good idea of how many they are or exactly where they are in the, in the field. And uh, one other thing, fall sampling is not a good way to predict what your spring populations are going to be. So you need to wait to that spring. Another easy uh, way to monitor is just using a potato. They love potatoes, so why not put out a potato? So you bury a whole potato four to six inches deep uh, in the spring or early uh, to mid-August. Uh, these are two periods of, of uh, increased activity. And uh, flag it. There's nothing worse than having volunteer potatoes attracting them. So you want to flag these, uh, particularly if you put out very many of them, and dig it up after two weeks. So here, we're not trying to capture the wireworms or have them hanging out of the bait bags. Here, we're just putting in a potato. So we're only, me only measuring, actually, this damage here that you see. So we're looking for evidence that in the area. And so you just... Uh, just examine them for wireworm tunnels. Another method is your uh, shovel sampling. And this is probably the easiest method. It gives you instant results and who doesn't like that? So you dig down about 10 inches, you lift that up on the shovel and then you're gonna kind of round off the edge. You wanna kind of you know, make it all alike so you can some, some way evaluate or, or get some uh, in, interesting data at least. So you're looking at about six inches in diameter of the soil and you're just gonna look through that soil. I often will carry like a lunch tray out to, the, out to the field and you can dump that on lunch tray, spread it out and look. And you know, wireworms are pretty easy to see because of their coloration. So you wanna do this uh, no less than 20 times uh, around a field to kind of give you an idea. But again, uh, this monitoring, uh, actually tells you that they're there, but um, it's really hard to pinpoint where they are in the, in the soil or in your field. So we are doing some adult wireworm monitoring. Uh, the thing is there's not a pheromone for all the different wireworms. 
So actually, we're only looking at two right now. We're looking at Agriotes lineatus and Agriotes obscurus. And um, the, the pheromones can be kind of finicky. You don't want to put out the lineatus and go over and, and do it without changing gloves because you can uh, cross-contaminate these really, really easily. And in fact, you don't even want to ship them. If you're shipping these pheromones to someone, you don't want to include them in the same shipment. You want to separate the shipments. Um, you need to know that these pheromone traps, what they tell you is whether you have agriotes species, first of all, kind of gives you an idea of perhaps the adult population there. Uh, but the bad thing is there's really no connection uh, between those pheromone trap numbers and your larval distribution in the field. So you may have this set out on the edge of a field and you say, oh my gosh, I had 500 today. And so they're, they're mostly on that edge of the field. Well, maybe not. Uh, so uh, don't, don't think there's any connection in, in that larval distribution. So a lot of this has been done in BC. These are actually, this is the Vernon pitfall trap, uh, photo by Van Herc. And over here, we've got another light trap produced by a, a BC group. And um, the idea on this one is that you want to uh, attract them with light to a pitfall trap and you want to try to exclude some things. So that's why they put this mesh around there. So you don't have a lot of uh, other beetles, uh, but um, uh, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. I, I think it's still kind of being uh, researched. Uh, the idea was because it's not a pheromone, you're not limiting yourself to only males and you're not limiting yourself to only these species. So if it were to work, it would be great because you would get all the different adult wireworms attracted there. So I think a little more research, uh, but uh, definitely um, it's, it's something to think about. At least we're moving in that direction. On this pitfall trap, I will warn you, uh, we, have had, um, we have had times when we opened it up and looked at it and there were more whole carabid beetles in there, those are ground beetles, than there were any, any adult uh, wireworms or click beetles. The, carabids just destroy them. So you know how I had to count those? I had to count heads and thoraxes to be able to figure out how many different um, adult uh, wireworms I had in the trap. So carabids can be a real problem. So you can see why they tried to eliminate some of those non-targets uh, in that met method of trapping. So let's focus on two different uh, crops here. We know wireworms love potatoes. Uh, and so here's a little summary about potatoes. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. Yep. Yep. Oh, here we go. So uh, when it comes to potatoes, when it's hot and dry, that uh, sort of increases the potential for risk because those wireworms are seeking out moisture and they will drill into the potato to find it. So not only potatoes, but turnips and some other root crops, uh, uh, even radish can be a real problem uh, when it's hot and dry. Uh, the longer the potatoes are in the ground, uh, the increases the uh, chances for damage. Uh, spring activity, wouldn't you know it, coincides right when seed potatoes are being planted. So even your potato seeds could be uh, damaged. Uh, many growers here use uh, Cruzamax, which is thymothoxam. Uh, for a seed treatment on potatoes, and it seems to have pretty good efficacy uh, for at least a while. And uh, thymothoxam is a neonicotinoid, remember? It's kind of making them drunk, making them stay away. That's all you need. Uh, and then, of course, don't forget, wireworm feeding uh, is prolonged in the fall. And so that's when you have those tubers. You're trying to get them to suberize in the ground before you dig them up to reduce the mechanical damage. But at the same time, you're risking more more damage by your, your wireworm. So it's a trade-off. You have to decide uh, how long to leave them in the ground. Wireworms also love lettuce. And so it happens that we are doing a, a quick little trial here. In fact, this is so quick, I just wanted to give you an idea of the treatment results. So sorry, no error bars or anything. We're only looking at two products. We're looking at Capture Farm, which is uh, a, a popular conventional product uh, by Fintron again. 
And we're also looking at Azera. So Azera is pyrethrin plus anime, and that is an organic product. So here we're comparing an organic product, organic control, uh, with a conventional control, along with an untreated. And so pretty much in, in the last week that we've been taking uh, sampling, uh, you can see how uh, things have been uh, moving along. Uh, you can see that the untreated has been uh, hit uh, quite a bit. These are averages, uh, average number of, uh, of plants that are alive or dead. And for the, the control, uh, you can see that, um, so this is average number live, sorry. So for the control, you can see that it's the lowest number. It, it may cross over with Azera sometime, but it looks to me like capture is significantly uh, better than the other treatment. But uh, it does give us some uh, hope that we can deter them for a little bit. If you look at the picture over on the left, uh, you can see that this was uh, the control area and you can see missing plants where we have uh, dug them out to check for wireworm. Here, if you could see this, this is probably um, the capture treatment. So definitely some, uh, some treatment effects there. Uh, and uh, finally, the uh, last method is a strategy that we're looking at in the Western SARE with Brooke Brower and uh, several other colleagues here in Western Washington. And so we're using a, an idea of attracting the wireworm larvae away from the main crop. And looking at this picture down here, you can see how we planted winter wheat uh, between the, um, the lettuce plantings. And so you can see how the lettuce could cross over to, uh, to the wheat and be attracted uh, to that more so than the lettuce. So that's the whole, that's the whole point of it. We are using a product, um, we're using a, a, a spinosad bait to see if that has better efficacy. So right now, uh, it seems like uh, the wheat itself is uh, better than uh, the wheat plus the, the bait. In uh, Canada, they're looking at attract and kill methods. So in this case, uh, they're planting treated wheat seed alongside the potatoes in the same furrow. You can see the treated wheat seed here. This is a uh, work by uh, Van Herk. And you can see over here uh, the results. Um, and uh, right here, you can see that um, the treated wheat was, uh, was really effective, uh, not quite as uh, time at, but um, pretty close. And so there's promise at this uh, tract and kill. It depends on whether growers want to be managing a wheat crop along with their potatoes. Uh, there's potential for nematodes. Uh, and we'll be looking hopefully at some nematode work and some other uh, organic products this fall. Uh, but uh, here you can see this uh, test or this trial out of um, Virginia back in 2002. Uh, they used several of the ones that we have here. Uh, Felti is a real popular one, Steinerema Feltii. And uh, you can see some treatment differences. The problem with, with um, nematodes is uh, it's inconsistent. So uh, not always uh, are you going to have uh, uh, great results. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. There are resistant potato varieties. Resistance doesn't mean that they don't attack them, but it means that you may have less damage, more marketable crop. Uh, if you look at some of the more native varieties like Ozette, uh, that might be if you're if you're growing for a farmer's market or whatever, then uh, maybe that would be an interesting uh, variety to try. You can see over here uh, one of our popular ones, Yukon Gold. Uh, this is percentage of infected tubers, uh, and it had about 15% uh, percent, uh, infected or infested, excuse me, uh, compared to some of the other ones like uh, Jacqueline Lee and. and Maybe this huckleberry could be a purple one, but there are definitely differences among varieties uh, as to uh, resistance or susceptibility. So uh, hopefully we'll be looking at some of these uh, products in the fall. Uh, Magistine, uh, there's a 2EE for Magistine for potato and sweet potato. And uh, this one, you can see the label right here. And this is a Marone uh, Bio Innovations product. And uh, this is a, um, if I could see the active ingredients, a Burkholdia is uh, a type of, uh, of the active ingredient in this one. So uh, anyway, there are, some, uh, there are some options for organic growers and uh, hold on, we're gonna be looking at some of those this fall, hopefully. A little uh, fun little bit I wanted to uh, in include is uh, the potential for wireworm uh, drip tape damage. I know I'm getting out of time here, so I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. 
Uh, so yes, wireworms love moisture and they will go after drip tape. And you might uh, begin to think you might have a problem when you see uneven water distribution, reduced irrigation efficacy. So if you see anything that looks like this, uh, then you can uh, recognize that wireworm uh, have eaten into the, um, the drip tape. And you can see here on the left, again, that characteristic round damage, a little bit of fraying on the edge, uh, so it's not just wireworm that will go after dip tape, but uh, it can be other uh, insects as well and other animals too, vertebrate animals. But uh, I just thought I'd throw this in as a, a bit of uh, interesting um, uh, trivia. And of course, there are ways that you can minimize uh, this damage. And, and if you think about it, it's one of those dumb moments. All you have to do is pressurize that drip tape as soon as, soon as you install it. And that's going to wet the soil around it so that they'll, they might be attracted to the wet soil, but that might keep them from drilling into the, into the drip tape. Of course, crop rotation and using a thicker tape, maybe a 15 mil instead of an eight mil, uh, might be a way to reduce that uh, drip tape damage. And then this is by no means uh, 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 the, the entire Bible on, on wireworms. Uh, so Ben and I have presented some information this morning that gives you an introduction to the insect, an introduction to management, what they like, uh, things you can do to try to minimize damage. Uh, it's an interesting insect and it's going to keep us all um, working for many, many years to come, I think. There are some uh, potentially new products uh, coming in the pipeline and uh, there's work already being done on those in uh, BC. So we can look forward to that, to potentially another mode of action product. So. I think uh, that is, uh, is the end of my program. I do have, uh, of course, a disclaimer slide. You've got to read those labels. Uh, it's up to you to read a label and, of course, um, to use it properly. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Bev and Ben. That was excellent. Um, I wanted to, we have many questions in the chat box, which is great. Thank you, everyone, for your interest. Um, I do want to say quickly, we can we can do a few questions, but we'll have um, Bev and Ben maybe um, write out answers to some of the ones we don't get to, and we can post that along with our video. The video will be posted on our website. If you're not subscribed to our listserv, um, you can do that on our homepage, and so we'll send out an announcement when that is posted, and we'll also post it to our website along with the questions. But let's do a few since we still have 70 people on the line. Um, so some of the questions I saw were uh, about which crops are most resistant to wireworm damage. There were some questions about common bean and fava bean, but generally which crops are most resistant? I guess that would be the non-crop hosts, like, uh, you know, your, um, your alfalfa uh, and also your, um, your um, uh, flax is another one. And uh, gosh, it just uh, left me. What, it, what was the one I talked about? Uh, sorry. Um, buckwheat, I think. Yes, thank you, Ben. Buckwheat. So yeah, there are differences. Uh, anything that's grains uh, is going to be highly susceptible. Uh, fava bean, I ran into some uh, pros and cons about that one, so I didn't include that here. Uh, it is a legume, uh, but uh, you know, beans can be struck as well. So you know, that one uh, wasn't as, uh, uh, as I guess, talked about as much as the, um, as the alfalfa and as the, uh, as the um, flax. <laughs> and yes, what, what, Ben? What was it? Buckwheat. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Great. Um, let's see, another question here. Is there a way to go after the, the beetle itself rather than the larval stage or eliminate the egg laying step? So, you know, that's what, uh, that's what uh, uh, they're trying to, to um, you know, create that light trap to be more specific for click beetles. I, right now, I can't see how it wouldn't attract lots of different things, but, um, you know, I think they're banking on the click beetles uh, landing outside and crawling through and uh, falling into that pitfall trap. And so that's how they're trying to make it more exclusively towards uh, wireworm. But um, 
yes, that's, that's still being worked on. And that's the only thing that I know of other than um, that, I mean, other than uh, chemical uh, methods to try to uh, kill the neonates, kill the larvae, uh, and um, maybe some of your uh, bifenthrins and some of your, um, your, your, even your neonics or, or those maybe could kill some of those baby neonates. We have had uh, also kill of the, of the wireworm from, um, from a pyrethroid because they would surface and then they would desiccate. So anyway, yes, that's some. Great, and we had several questions about um, control in small scale organic farms or even in, in gardens. Um, do you have any recommendations there? There were some questions about mustard meals or beneficial nematodes. Yeah, so we pretty much covered all of those in the in the talk. So I think they can refer back refer back to those. Uh, nematodes can give you uh, inconsistent results. Azera looks pretty good so far, uh, but it is uh, its efficacy is dropping down. So you'd have to look at that label and see what your application rates are for that. Uh, again, you can go to trap crops and, and things like that to attract them away. Uh, and so that might be something that a small scale uh, farmer would be more likely to try. Uh, so there are some methods. I, I am anxious to try the Magistine uh, this fall. So uh, you can look in, and uh, look into that. There is a 2EE, so it is registered on potato and sweet potato, but not other crops that I know of. So you have to look at the label and, and see. Um, so definitely there are some potential things, but there's going to be reapplication and, and combining that with some of the cultivation techniques. The more things you can combine in an organic approach to control, the better off you are. So, you know, looking at tillage, uh, looking at, um, you know, these, uh, these, these uh, organic products as well and, and uh, trapping out or attracting away. Great. Um, there was a question, how and where do the adults lay their eggs? Are the females selecting certain crops where they lay their eggs that will be a good food source for the worms? Yeah, I mean, I could, Ben, you want to take that one? Or? I'm not totally sure. I mean, I would assume that um, just wherever they emerge from, you know, they're going to be close to, so the larvae are going to feed on the crop and then they're going to pupate right there in the soil around the crop and then when they come out as an adult, um, I would assume that they, they don't move too far to mate and lay their eggs. So they should just be kind of right where they need to be um, or they may travel a short distance to look, to look for new hosts, but I don't know specifically. So that's something we could look up and provide a better answer for. Uh, remember, they love grasses. They love grass, they love sod, they love pastures. Uh, so, um, uh, even if you have edges of your field that have grass, that can uh, attract them as well. So uh, grass and sod and, and pastures are some of their favorite uh, places to oviposit. Great. Um, maybe one last question. Are wireworms a threat to fruit trees and bushes like blueberries and cane fruit? Uh, I've seen root weevil damage for uh, blueberries, but I haven't seen what I would say is wireworm damage uh, in blueberries. The fruit trees, the, the adults really don't cause any problem. It's only the larval stages. So you're thinking that, you know, the larval stages are going to be uh, uh, hitting vulnerable crops that are in the soil or uh, have a crown next to the soil, like your lettuces. Uh, so no, they're not effect to not a problem with uh, fruit trees, and uh, to my knowledge, there's been no uh, reports of damage to uh, blueberry uh, or to red raspberry because of um, the uh, of the wireworms. But um, they definitely have their own group of pests. Great. Well, um, it's 12.10 now, so I think we'll, we'll call that good, but we'll make sure all these questions are in the, um, the feed with the video, and if Ben and Bev had, have anything to add to any of them, we can post that there. So thank you so much. We had more than 80 people join, which is really exciting. We're glad that this virtual um, method is actually reaching more people. So we're, we're going to have more seminars coming up later in the summer. I think Dr. Lindsay Dutoy is going to do a seminar on white rot. Um, so we'll be posting about that soon. 
But thank yeah. you, everyone, and thank you, Ben and Bev, for your excellent seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.